Biases and stereotypes hurt and separate us. Open hearts and minds heal and unite us. Hi, it's Joan. Hey, have you seen today's paper? Well, let me tell you what's on the front page. It's a picture of a poster that my neighbor Bob put in his front yard. He did it to express his anger with County Commissioner Jones and that bypass that Jones wants to put in. You know Commissioner Jones, he's the black one, the only black one. Well, Bob's poster is a picture of a monkey with Commissioner Jones' name on it, and then it says, we should pay him with bananas. Racist? No, no, I, I don't think Bob was trying to make a racist statement. The statement Bob was trying to make was that he disagreed with Commissioner Jones' position on the bypass, and he used a picture of a monkey to do that. Look, I'm in my dentist's waiting room. I'll talk to you later. Look at all this coverage that this silly poster is getting. What do you think about that? Why do you ask? Well, I think some people are making way too much out of this. It's just a picture in someone's yard for Pete's sake. A picture of whom? Well, the picture isn't the point, you know. It's about Commissioner Jones' position on the bypass. That could cause a lot of problems for a lot of people including my neighbor Bob. He's the one that put up the poster. So if the issue is the bypass, why is there a monkey in the picture? Look, I know that some black people got, well, kind of upset because they thought the monkey picture was putting down all black people, but it was not. And you know this because? Bob told me. He said it was only directed at Commissioner Jones because of his stupid position. Bob told me the picture is not racist. And who gets to decide that? Perhaps the people who have been depicted for generations as monkeys and gorillas in an effort to demean and exclude them should be asked. Since Bob has been getting all this flack about his sign, he checked into an attorney about his First Amendment rights. And the attorney told him that since Bob was an expressing an opinion, not a threat to do physical harm, just an opinion posted on his private property, that it was part of his freedom of speech rights. So why is everyone bothering him? Other people have freedom of speech rights too also to express their opinion that Bob did the wrong thing. Well, I feel badly for Bob. He's really upset about this. Bob is the victim? I, I really think you, well, all of you, misunderstood and misinterpreted what Bob was trying to convey. I thought Commissioner Jones made a bad choice too. I'm assuming you support Commissioner Jones' decision? And why do you assume that? Well, uh, to stick together. Mm -hmm. I do not agree with the Commissioner Jones' position on the bypass. Look, I was extremely relieved when we finally got a person of color into a county commissioner position. That does not mean I believe and agree with everything he believes and everything he does. Oh. Look, I want you to know I do not have a racist bone in my body. In fact, I don't even see color. Well, that's curious. If someone has red hair, do you see it? Well, yes, of course. Seeing the color of someone's skin is not the problem. 
having automatic assumptions about what that color means is the problem. Oh, I, I had not thought about it that way. Have you or neighbor Bob ever disagreed with something the other commissioners have done? Oh yes, oh my yes. Several of us in the neighborhood have, and we let them know about it too. We burned up their phone lines and poured letters and emails into their offices. Well, why not respond the same way when a person with brown skin says something you don't like? Look, I am not a racist. I had a black roommate in college. Well, bless your heart. <laughs> in your whole life, you've known one African-American person. Well, there is this black guy who works in my office. Mm-hmm. Do you understand that you have not had the opportunity to learn how life is different in America for people with other skin colors? Listen, I, I do want you to know that we don't mean to put down Commissioner Jones as a person. He is so well-spoken. And why does that surprise you? Aren't all the commissioners well-spoken? Look, that bypass could make it easier for a lot of new people to move in, and I bet you don't want your neighborhood to change either. Everyone lives in my neighborhood. Who lives in yours? Well, most of us have lived there forever, raised our kids, go to church together. It's been so comfortable. We have so much in common, but there have been some recent changes, and I'm sure this would concern you too. Two families from India just moved in, and we're concerned that they may be, you know, Muslim. How do their neighbors treat them based on thinking they may be Muslim? Oh, well, we just stay away. But Apparently, someone spray painted something kind of ugly on the back of their houses, and it looked like a couple trash cans were emptied in their front yards. But we think it was just a prank done by some kids. And I need to say, we never had that kind of problem until they moved here. Just a prank done by some kids. I hope your other neighbors, the ones who have been there forever, the school, certainly the churches, and you as an individual have spoken publicly and loudly that you are appalled that this act of hatred has happened in your community. And I hope that you have all reached out to the new families who have been targeted to express your concern and support. Has that happened? There's been a lot of silence. Silence is the welcome mat for hate. Well, I don't know what responsibility I would have to speak up. I didn't do it. Your silence is the welcome mat for your neighbor's hatred towards the people they don't even know. Your silence, when someone is harmed by word or action, your silence says, that's okay with me. But. It's really not okay with me. Then go knock on your neighbor's doors and your old neighbor's doors and tell them. But they might be Muslim and you never know about them. Exactly. You don't know anyone until you get to know them as an individual. Has there been a lot of conversation at your church about the vandalism your new neighbors have experienced? Perhaps a sermon about how Jesus always stands with the excluded, the judged, and the disenfranchised. Well, um, for quite a while now, our pastor has been urging us to become a partner congregation with the inner city church. Hmm. Are you assuming that inner city means black? Well, I don't go into the city, but Yes, I, I guess so. 
Anyway, my pastor says partner congregations enter a covenant with each other to regularly fellowship and worship together and eventually do a joint service project. Now, there's some controversy about this idea. Some people are nervous that we won't have much in common with an inner city church. So what was the purpose of becoming partner congregations? Well, maybe like you said, to get to know each other as individuals. What a fine thing for congregations of any faith to do. Yes, I guess so. I bet you don't have to go into the inner city to find congregations with people of color in them. I bet there are some near your suburban church. Uh, you know, I've heard there are, uh, maybe so. And you know, you've said quite a few things that were difficult for me to hear, but I must say, you were quite an educator. <sighs> yeah. The truth is, I came here just to read my magazine and get my teeth cleaned. But people covered with this are often faced with a choice. Put up with people saying things that divide us or be an educator while waiting to get your teeth cleaned. Oh, sorry. So have you ever been negatively judged by people who don't know you? What do you mean? Every person of color, every woman who wears a hijab knows what I mean. It means when you walk in the door, people look at your skin color and come to a list of automatic assumptions about your intelligence, your integrity, your morality, and your right to be here. I, I guess the closest I've come to that was a couple times when my boss thought I should not become a supervisor because I am a woman. Then you got a taste of it. And it tasted bad. And, you know, I don't really do not want to be a part of that happening to others for any reason. Then speak. Ms. Johnson, we're ready for you. Peace be with you. And with you. Thank you so much for speaking. Uh, my question is, are there expressions you often hear that are offensive, but the speaker insists that they are not racist? Yes, thank you for that question. Um, one of my favorites is, uh, you're so well-spoken. They're so articulate. And um, another expression that I hear quite a lot, uh, particularly from well-meaning white people, who say, why do we need to deal with racism when we have so many other issues to deal with? But I'm not racist, mind you. And um, even as a society, we need to understand that a lot of the issues that we're dealing with today are rooted in racism. So yeah, there, there are a number of expressions um, that are offered very often from a heart of being complimentary and constructive, but usually those folks who are using those expressions really don't understand how offensive they really are. I always wanted to know why there are more basketball players and baseball uh, players are African American rather than um, ice hockey and uh, golf players. Traditionally, it has to do with access. Uh, very often, really going back some years, it really began in public schools, 
where the only sports, particularly that African American males had available to them, tended to be basketball and football. And as time has gone on, there is still some, there's greater access to golf and hockey experiences, but they're also very limited because black folks are not often not welcomed in those places like athletic clubs um, and other types of clubs where golf and hockey are offered as a sport. But as I said, it is very slowly changing, but we have a very long way to go. I've heard about the quote talk uh, that black parents give their children regarding interaction with the police. And I wonder how that's different for white parents and, and their children. Mm -hmm. White parents will typically teach their children that the police are here to protect us, that, um, that they are their friends, and if they ever find that they are in a threatening situation or if a crime is being committed or if they don't feel safe, that they should call the police. I remember the talk that my mother gave to my brother who was six years younger than I am. And she was very specific and very direct. She said to be aware of the police, make sure that you are staying perfectly within the law. If you are on the road driving, if the speed limit is 55, you do 54. She said that the police are not necessarily here to protect us, but particularly as a young black male, you have to be particularly careful you want to stay out of the way of the police. And you don't even want to give them a reason to look your way. So in the white community, the police are our friends, or are your friends. In the black community, the police are a threat, and they are a danger. So we have to be aware of our surroundings at all times and aware of their presence at all times. I was talking with a, a teenage young man, African American recently, and um, he told me that if he was ever approached by the police on the street, he would immediately lay face down with his hands spread out. It just mm -hmm. broke my heart. Yes, and when, when uh, black folks are driving, even myself, I've been stopped four times in the span of a month and a half in my own neighborhood. And once in uh, Detroit, when I was there for training and the speed limit was 25 miles per hour, I didn't know it, I was doing 28. So the police officer pulled me over late at night for going three miles over the speed limit and my immediate response to that after I pulled over was to keep my hands on the steering wheel so that he could see them at all times. The threat and the danger and the concern are very real. You just played a character who was clearly tired of teaching, of educating us. Can you tell a little bit more about that? Yes, I am tired of educating, but I educate anyway. Um, I was in a, um, in a workshop and there was a 22-year-old African-American young woman. And I kind of had to chuckle because she expressed how she's tired. And I'm more than twice her age. So I looked at her and I was like, honey, you got a long way to go. And yes, I do get tired, um, but educating is necessary. But I also want to point out, it's not only necessary, and I'm only speaking for myself, 
it's not only necessary for me to educate white folks, but it's also necessary to educate people of color because there are so many cultural misunderstandings and just downright cultural ignorance that in order for people of color to advance and to make changes, whether it's in legislation, whether it's in their neighborhood, we need each other. We all need allies. So there is the one challenge of educating white folks and sometimes other people of color about black folks, but there is also a need to educate black folks and other persons of color about how the white community operates, how the white community views things, and how our cultures tend to be different. And to give, a, to give an example, um, the organization that I, that I serve had a conference at a church a couple of years ago. And the executive director is an African-American male. And it was an ethnically mixed group, but there were a large number of white folks in that room. And then after the executive director finished speaking, some of the white folks stood up and they questioned and challenged everything that he said. And then the African-American folks in the audience, they were offended and felt that his leadership was being undermined and demeaned. So those black folks withdrew from the movement and haven't been back since. And it's largely because of a cultural misunderstanding. And these are all people of faith. And in this particular faith, it was natural for folks to question their pastor or their clergy person. But the black folks didn't know that and didn't understand that. So there is, there is a cross educational experience that has to take place. And being a black woman, being a person of color, my responsibility and I will even say my calling to educate really is not only so that we can all get along, but so that we can all work together to affect change and make the kind of impact that's necessary for us all to have the quality of life that we deserve. Um, my a uh, 16-year-old goddaughter who is African-American um, said to me a couple weeks ago that her, her tender age of 16, when she goes someplace new um, and she doesn't know who all is going to be there, mm -hmm. she worries about being the only one mm -hmm. and making a mistake. Mm. Yes. Being the only one. Um, there are actually two layers to that. Uh, do I experience it? All the time. Yeah. All the time. And being a black woman, there is, you know, there is that um, kind of that, uh, that double impact because there are times when I am very often the only person of color in the room. Uh, there are times when I am the only woman in the room who happens to be black. And um, when I was younger, I felt the pressure of having to represent the entire race while I was in the room. And then the other layer to that is walking into a space where I don't feel that there is anyone who can relate to me or my experience. And in that particular space, being in my skin, the way I am in my skin, um, I can be challenged by it or I can encourage myself and remember that I have a right to be in that space. And as a Christian, I also believe that God wants me to be in that space for a particular reason. 
And it took many years for me to get to that place. When I was younger, I felt more of the pressure of, I have to represent the race. If I do something wrong, the whole race is going to be just, just totally dismissed. And then as I became, got older, I started to realize that yes, I am part of a wonderful race and a wonderful group of people, but I do not represent everyone. And where I found my greatest freedom is accepting the fact that there would be times when I am the only one in the room. And even when I'm the only one in the room, I have to be who I am. I have to be authentically me, authentically a black woman who happens to be the only one in that particular space. When I was a little girl, which was a pretty long time ago, uh, people with dark skin were called colored. And then um, the terminology has changed. Uh, African-American, um, let's see, uh, Negro followed colored. Uh, I've heard you refer to yourself as black, so that's what you're comfortable with. Is that, is that true for many people, or what would you suggest? I would suggest two things. Um, one, if you do not have the presence of mind to ask the person how they want to self-identify, then I would, by default, lean on African-American. I self-identify as black as an acknowledgement that I have brothers and sisters in continental Africa, the Caribbean, Latin America, and other places on the globe. So that's why I self-identify as black. Another option is to call them by their name. <laughs> Hi, would you please explain what is meant by school to prison pipeline? Do you think it really happens? Oh, it most definitely happens, and in various ways. In addition to the fact that uh, public school systems where the students are majority black and brown, they are grossly underfunded. In the city of Harrisburg, the school district is underfunded by $29 million. And that was in 2017. So in public schools where, like I said, there are mostly black and brown students, they are not afforded the same level of education as public school districts where the majority of the students are white. So there is a very low quality of education. There is limited access to the arts and, um, and in many cases, and to athletics. Um, and there are very often not no or not enough after school programs and not enough, uh, not enough activities to occupy students, particularly when they come from families where they're either in single parent homes or both the parents are working multiple jobs. And there are times when, um, depending on where you are, I know that in the history of public school districts, certain public school districts here in Pennsylvania, there was a no tolerance rule. And essentially what that meant is if the teacher in the classroom decided that a child was being disrespectful, asked too many questions, they could literally call the police on those students. There was an example that was shared with me not too long ago where a second grade student in Philadelphia had asked the teacher a question about what it was that they were learning, but the question that he asked and the way in which he asked it made her believe that he was being disrespectful and had challenged her knowledge. So she called the police. And when she called, the child was taken away. He was put into quote unquote custody. But when children in public school systems, whenever the police are called on them, that goes on their permanent record. 
So there are students as young as eight years old, all the way through high school, they're already developing their prison record. So that by the time they reach a certain age, it's only natural for them to uh, commit a crime. And even if they don't commit a crime and they're falsely accused, like Meek Mills today, um, and other, fo other folks who either committed minor crimes or didn't commit a crime at all, they're already conditioned from early childhood development to move toward either having some kind of engagement with the police for no particular reason or committing a minor crime and landing in prison. So the way the public school systems in black and brown areas are structured, the way the educational system is designed, our children are often going from school to prison. So yes, the school to prison pipeline is very real. May I ask a follow-up question? Like, like, what can we do about it? Like, what do you suggest? Ah, there are so many things and very simple things. One, we have so many buildings, especially faith buildings, that sit empty. Monday through Saturday, and for two hours maybe on Sunday. Our houses of faith are perfect areas to have after school programs, to have um, arts and crafts, to have music programs, even to, do, even to teach whatever the, the, the sacred writings of your particular faith. That's one thing. The other thing to do is, um, as they're doing in Philadelphia, it's called diversion planning. And that's essentially what I just described. If faith communities, nonprofit organizations could coalesce so that they're supplementing the education that the students are getting through the public school system, and also being in relationship with young people, find out what are their gifts, what are their talents, what are their interests, and then as a community, if we're building beloved community, as a community, we can pour into those youth, into those children, so that they don't have to go through that pipeline. And that's why it's called diversion planning, because we're diverting them from traveling down that path by offering support, offering them love, and offering them other things to do that will affirm them, that will prepare them for whether they're going to college or going into a trade or starting their own business. That's what we can do. And this public school system, like I said, which is grossly underfunded, they will not only appreciate it, but they'll also support it because it makes life easier for the parents, for the teachers, and it helps the school district to stretch those dollars a little further until we get better funding. Um, my question is, what led you to write this play? And um, what allowed you to use the monkey poster? Very sadly, nothing that came out of my mouth as this character were things that we had to make up. They were all things that we've heard good church folk going folks say. Um, the monkey poster, so very sadly, is a, a part of the history of racial harassment of this country, of depicting people of color as monkeys or gorillas. Um, when we first started uh, drafting this conversation was right after a very similar incident had happened in this area, where an African American elected official was depicted as a gorilla. And as we watched the response to that play out on social media, a lot of white folks stepped forward to say, A, that wasn't racist, and B, don't be so thin-skinned. Um, so we had great concern about this, some folks deciding what is offensive to others. And the other thing that greatly concerned us is that when he did that, when he 
portrayed himself as a guerrilla to represent this elected official, nobody in his community spoke up to say, this is way out of line. And so when we watched that phenomena occur again, 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 we thought, we need to grab a hold of this. Uh, not, not just the depiction of people of color as primates, but also white folks saying, look, this is not racist. So that was, that was the, the incentive behind this conversation. And that local elected official happened to have been on a mission trip in Nigeria when it happened. But what can I say as a constituent and voter to my elected decision makers to get them to listen to increase school funding in those areas that have been historically underfunded and continue to be underfunded? Thank you for that question. It has been proven numerically and statistically that there is a specific racial bias in public education funding. You should make sure that you find out what your education budget is, do some research to find out where it is comparatively in your area to other school districts as well as statewide. And again, you can visit, which is an excellent thing to do so that your legislators know who you are and that you are a voter. If you can bring other folks with you, that's even better. You can also call and you can write to make sure that any legislation that calls for an increase in your education budget and in particular equitable increase in the education budget and you don't call, write, or visit just once, you follow up, you pay attention and you talk to all the like-minded folks that you know so that they are also putting pressure and holding our legislators accountable for what it is that we put them in office to do.